Hi everyone, my name is Beata Vitek and this is Fashion Knowledge, a podcast educating, disrupting and shaping fashion futures. Fashion Knowledge is brought to you by Unfolding Strategies, a consultancy and education lab for digital, inclusive and sustainable fashion in Web3. Hi, welcome everyone. This week, our guest is Ivan Popirev. Uh, Ivan, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here with us today. Thank you. Uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, you're an inventor, a scientist, you're also an interaction designer, and as of this year, also a co-founder of Archetype AI. Could you briefly introduce your work and yourself? So my name is Ivan, and I kind of look at myself as an um, engineer and inventor and scientist. I um, started working back in the days in virtual reality when virtual reality and augmented reality was not really something people were doing. And over the years, I uh, worked uh, in some of the like large companies and tried to invent the future ways to interact with uh, computing and then through that for the physical world. I uh, worked uh, at Sony in Japan for uh, uh, eight years or so to build future consumer electronic devices and we did some interesting work there. Then I worked at Disney, Walt Disney, working for the Imagineering, building parks and resorts. Also, there was a lot of interest, how can we make the worlds which Disney built, the physical world, Disney built interactive and responsive, just like, you know, you can have it on a computer in the movie. And, um, and then I was working at Google for, uh, until recently, for about eight years, where I was working a lot of, spent maybe uh, half my time working on Project Jacquard, which is fundamentally trying to reinvent what clothing means, what fashion means, when you have technology and fashion together. And Project Solid, which is uh, a new way to interact with the physical world environment using the radars, so the fundamental new technology. And uh, over, as of recently, maybe six months ago, we, uh, a group of us from Google, formed a completely new company called Archetype. And uh, we we will uh, start building a new, 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 new chapter of exploration about this story. Yeah, I think we're going to, I hope we're going to uh, dive in three of those uh, projects you describe in next seconds. But before we start, I would like to, I would like for us to focus for a second fashion. You said that with Jacquard projects, you were working on uh, rethinking or reinventing what clothes are. Um, and it's also your work at Google. This is how I also discovered your work and been following it for a couple of years. Um, to me, fashion is very interesting because it's a, you know, it's a collective at, at scale. It's something that we all do every day. It's about also giving a shape to emerging futures as well. It's very close to the body. So I'm curious, uh, before we start diving deeper, why fashion, why some of the things you invented and worked on uh, were in a way either fashion, either belonged to fashion or contextualized through fashion. Right. I mean, for all the reasons you mentioned before, um, one of the most, I mean, the technical reasons is more kind of philosophical reasons. For the technical reasons, things you wear are uh, probably um, the, one of the ways to think about modern technology, particularly uh, as it progresses forward, is the technology becoming smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and becoming closer and closer to your body. Right? We started with the computers with the size of the room. You know, you don't even sit in the same computer as a, as a, as a, as a, the, same, the same room as a computer, right? The computer is all the building, you get the opposite location. And as technology progresses, this, this physical distance between computing devices and humans becoming smaller, right? Uh, and, you know, the variety, there's a variety of configurations that changes, but fundamentally they're becoming closer. And the time of response from human to reaction from the computer also becoming smaller. You know, something before which took the days, now it takes seconds. You know? And uh, clearly it's, you know, when, the, when things become kind of close to the wearables, uh, it's becoming the universe said now that the, the real is the most expensive real estate is a human body, right? Like how many things you can put in your wrist, how many things you can put in their face. So, from a very technical point of view, using clothing as a platform for the computing is very attractive because that's where they have access to the most important functions of the human body and a lot of new services and ideas and, and use cases can be developed this way. From a philosophical point of view, I've been always interested and always quite um, 
uh, quite fascinated by this, by the, um, but it says physical artifacts human built, by human built artifacts, uh, because the, um, if you think about it, the, you know, the world split in two pieces, things which apparently naturally, you know, mountains and rivers and trees and everything else, and things people built, right? And humanity survived um, only because of things we've built, right? If you haven't, have you know, imagine living without cities, without, um, without transportations, without everyday things we built to use every day, uh, I think uh, survival would be, would be challenging, right? It would be very hard to, to, to live. Yeah, I think clothing and the way things were probably one of the first and the most fundamental artifacts people built, right? So it's a quintessential thing uh, that that's, that's people invented as one of the first things. Uh, it's, we can argue what was the first invented, you know, basket or, or, or piece of clothing people put over that we can argue, but definitely one of the first. And if you sit to the history of the humanity, is those most important thing like like a barrel, like a wheel, um, and and the the uh, you know the pan. Those things usually the one which is the most kind of significantly can significantly impact the the combination of those things with new technologies kind of most significant impact to human civilization. And you can see this happening with you know with them um, with transportation means of transportation, means of writing food, uh, but fashion and clothing somehow stay kind of the same, you know, the, it's the materials has changed and uh, things has changed, but they were less affected by the modern technology. So I was always wondering how can we merge this to, how can we merge, how we can take clothing and fashion to the next level, uh, where it's become less of the, um, a passive artifact you wear to protect yourself and, you know, demonstrate and, you know, show some, some social, social, um, factors. But uh, becomes a uh, also infused with with the te modern technology shit as you can. So that's sort of my my, my interest in fashion in combination with this too. It's very interesting because it sounds like to you like fashion is a bit of a build part of building blocks for infrastructure for civilization to survive. And I bet that we will yeah that we will get back to this body real estate metaphor i'm very interested in that but we can keep it for later okay so so let's maybe talk first about jacquard um what was it how did it came about um i would be very interested particularly thinking in how you tried to weave technology into textile and then also how the idea of the of the sensor of the tag uh, came about okay i don't well yeah Thank you. So, so the um, I think one of the biggest part of the fashion, uh, which, which is at the apparel, of, uh, is of course the powerful aesthetic qualities of fashion. Right. The um, the aesthetics can never be separate from 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 the fashion is about. You cannot treat fashion just really as a functional component. And uh, I'm always was fascinated by by the by the cultural aspect as well. It was important thing of the fashion is textile. Uh, the um, the design of textile, the uh, both graphic design but also material and you know structural is is extremely important for for the for the fashion. It creates the look and feel and appropriateness and seasons and so forth. Right? If you look at the history of textile, is a different textile patterns which change. Uh, you know, there's a massive difference between the tweed and you know and tell. So, so the Classic. So, what we we decided thinking about is it possible if you want to stay true to fashion, if you want to stay true to apparel production of textile, it would be possible to uh, say you know, with well, basically it was ideal to stay true to textile, which means that textile should be produced smart textiles. If we want to make smart textiles, textile just assessing capabilities, the capability capabilities built in the textile, so that you can make a technology. Um, like completely invisible and, and wearable in a way, um, like you wear the jacket, you have to weave technology into the textile the same way as uh, anything else. So you should be able to produce textile, the factories, which makes it done, right? You don't have to, because you have the technological production. If you ask anybody in Silicon Valley, it would be very simple. Take, take a piece of textile, slap a piece of technology into that, you know, either by gluing and stuff, and you're kind of, you're done. 
we show that it's that's that's not the right way to go. Um, you need to uh, first of all this process of attaching technology to fashion uh, to a piece of textile would be quite challenging in general. Um, it's just um, additional step of production which makes this more difficult. And the um, taking uh, so, so so it has to be natural to the fashion. You have to go take to the factory. You have to weave it to the factory and use any factory in the world. Uh, which produces textile should be able to use the technology because you have a massive manufacturing uh, facilities already built for fashion and for the um, um, production of textile. So in order to do that, we decided to go even deeper. So like if you want to use a weave a uh, technology into the fashion, you have to start with the yard because the yard itself has to be uh, withstand all the because the fundamental block of building textile it has to withstand all the possible uh, complexities of you know weaving, washing, bleaching, uh, dyeing. Because the textile goes through a lot of material, with a lot of steps as it goes through the, through the production. So we started by building. Uh, so we, in fact, we started by designing our own yarn, which can withstand all these complexities of this textile. And then you know, it's uh, it was actually we built very unique piece of yarn, very unique piece of technology. Which can withstand any kind of uh, weaving uh, technology, uh, jets, different jets. There is a, there is a, a looms. We have a water looms. We have like power power parts uh, looms where you that where the um, it's moves using water using 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 uh, using um, uh, air. So uh, you know the weight of the of the textile you know define how quickly it moves. This becomes wet, becomes heavy. So we have to, as you washing it, this can break. So you have to make it doesn't break when you are washing it. It has some pertaining kind of mechanical qualities, but also should be able to be easy to attach. So we we designed a whole new type of yarn, and then went on through manufacturing. We worked in Japan. We did a lot of work in Japan on that because um, out of all the countries, Japan has a very 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 unique textile industry with unique capabilities which nobody else has. So we did a lot of work in Japan building those textiles, and after that we built the collaborations with few um, uh, companies. We did uh, where we can t- where we went to them and said, like, "Look, this is a piece of textile. Don't think about the technology. Think about the piece of textile." But just like you know, nylon was was new at some point, or other kind of textile, you know, this is kind of new material for you to think about how you can make a new kind of garment. So again, we tried to go from classic. Technology driven design to clothing, to the um, apparel driven design uh, of, of of the smart one. So, yeah, so that's so we're working with Levi's after that and uh, Yves Saint Laurent with the Samsonite and Adidas to build this exam- exemplar of product where this naturally built technology can become part of the manufacturing process of the textile and use it. You can use technology just like use buttons and, 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 and uh, zippers and everything else. That was kind of the basic concept to make sure that the smart garments are done by people who create garment and not by people who invent technology. Okay, and then for someone who never saw a video of the Jacquard Levi's jacket, so what then does it do? I have this textile, I'm a designer, uh, I made a garment, and then from a, from both, let's say, designer perspective, fashion designer perspective, and user perspective, what what does it what could it do for me? What were the what were the main applications? Right. So the main application for this for the first generation of products, and we we, we did the first generation. Um, it was uh, mostly to understand what people want to do, right? So and then translate those functions into the easy to access um, easy to access uh, functionality. In early stage of of, uh, of of this project for Jacquard, the basic concept was that uh, people should not be using their mobile phones. People should be and and people shouldn't be spending all the time typing and and constantly distracted by that. Uh, the the mobile phone can be in the bag or in the pocket, and once you put it there, it's already if you think about it from that perspective, you take mobile phone and put your your phone in the jacket, it's already becoming a smart jacket. It just doesn't know about it. So we want to make a smart jacket, a smart bag, or a smart shoe, which actually knows about it, right? So we, uh, so whenever you put a phone into your pocket, 
it activates um, some part of your jacket which becomes sensitive to your input. And then with the simple gestures, you can control your phone without having to take the phone out of the, out of the bag. So if you, have, if you have a head falls, or if you have a, um, the very first product, for example, was a, a, a jacket done for the biking. And it was done with Levi's. They have this line of products for, for, uh, for biking, which is a very thin denim or denim-like product where you can go, uh, bike through the, you know, through the, during the rain, during the, uh, during the bad weather, through the New York City. It was um, made of denim. It was very breathable and yet it was rather resistant. So you can, you can do all stuff. And uh, the kind of the concept was, you know, you buy through a CD and you say a, um, a delivery manager, a CCT, you know, a messenger, right? You're driving with a bike trying to do your stuff and you get a phone call from your boss trying to take delivery. You should be able to accept the phone while you're on the bike and trying to navigate the street without having to stop under the rain, kick out the phone. Uh, phones get lost, phones get dropped. So we built a, on the sleeve, that was a woven piece of, of fabric of uh, smart fabric which in the denim where you can understand simple gestures like swipe, swipe up, swipe down, tap and double tap. Uh, also, there was a piece of electronics built in which provides vibration and uh, visual feedback LED. So whenever for example, the phone call comes, you can see it, through the, you can feel it through vibration and on with the on your, on your sleeve and you can make it basic function. You can reject the phone, you can accept the phone, uh, or we can send to the to the to, to the to the uh, to the voice machine, right? So, and um, and you can program basically this universal patch on your on your sleeve to do anything you like. It can, it can be it can be uh, on the phone. You can re record it to control the music, control the map. It can give you map directions. It can can give you um, uh, next next appointment. Can access the calendar. You can you can configure this stuff any way you want. So the most important things that you um, you need to do with the phone. So it's sort of like almost like a bookmark for most of the most important things to activate it or respond to them where they come. So so we saw that was basically we, at, at this particular combination, this particular product, we saw the garment as an extension of other critical infrastructure you have. So it becomes connected, it's the proper connected, it's not really smart garment, but connected garment. So you connect it to your, your, your phone. In the future, we are thinking that uh, as you're building this stuff, it's going to be connected to more things. The garment can be connected. There, and it'll happen very transparently. So you just put it on jacket and put the phone and then automatically connect, right? So we thought like this phone being, uh, be, will be able to be connected to more things. It can be connected to your car. It can be connected to your um, to your home. It can be connected to your office desk. You can, like, so as this smart thing is becoming like, Smart kind of things becoming more and more like around us. Um, as you go through the day, it's automatically connected and disconnected to things around you. So you don't need to have any controls more than your garment, right? Your garment becomes the universal controller for everything in the world. But this also. I have a question because I'm thinking that this is very fascinating, but it kind of, and I'm, I'm very curious when doing, uh, you know, user research and thinking, as you said, how people would interact, how people would use it. Our hand gesture and our movements, apart obviously from, you know, scrolling and uh, certain behaviors that happen with when we started touching screens continuously in, uh, in the last years. Is I mean, how did you work on developing those, you know, hand movements, different languages, because those things are very, I don't know, also culturally dependent. I'm just thinking about it from like a user psychology perspective. Right, right, right. So um, it's, um, it's a very good question. And it's the something we um, we spend a lot of time arguing internally, right? So um, because technology obviously can do anything anything you want, and um, there is a a um, you know argument was um, should it be man the, the very basic discussion was should it be similar to the stuff you do with mobile phones? Or should we create a new language? This is the first kind of point you try to go a different direction, right? And if you create a new language, what is based on? And let's say there's a language of humans or a language of the computers, right? Um, and if you go to language of the humans, the very natural directions would be to create some sort of some sort of like um, symbols, right? A circle, triangle, a uh, a um, an arrow, or 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 maybe the language of music, where you do a different 
uh, rhythms like tap, double tap, repeat rhythms, and so so forth. Right. So the file always should come up completely different type of language, right? Something nothing, something, something not, not new. So we very quickly decided not to invent something completely new because the most invent something completely new to bond with the the teaching people about the something completely new is because very very hard. It takes like really long time. But what Apple released um, went from release multi-touch on the phone, right? If you remember, it took years before people started using it. Even now, I'm not sure they're using this to the full extent, right? The, basics, the simplicity is very important. It has to be as simple as possible. And um, so we, we said, like, well, we have to rely on, on things people are really familiar with, you know? And the most familiar, and then the most familiar people for people is writing and, uh, and drawing. So your fingers in the sand, you draw little characters, maybe little fish, so a little bit small, or something like that. Um, and um, and a phone, right? So the phone probably became the universal lingua these days. So we decided to go to to the phone disruption because again, it's quite fascinating. But the universal language right now in humanity around the world is a human interruption with the computers, right? So. There's more people who understand hieroglyphics of Apple, which invented, you know, by Susan Kerr in H's, with all the little symbols and characters, what they means, how they work. The people who speak, say, Chinese or Japanese, who also use hieroglyphics, right? Um, like everybody knows how to use uh, Windows or, or Apple, which is based on the same system of hieroglyphics and visual language, right? Um, I would say. Uh, what ninety percent of the people in the world have a smartphone right now, and they know what means swipe and doesn't in in you know, double tap and, and tap means is so it's incredible. We create the shit. It's a completely new language people created with international technology, significantly more universal than any other human language to create. For that reason, we decided to go and mimic language of interaction with a mobile phone, with something people are really familiar with, and we wanted to communicate that ads belong to the same family. Of communications as as a phone, so that's why we use things like tapping, double tapping, swiping, and basic direction controls. And these controls are something people really understand from things like, you know, touch screens and public touch screens and the phones and game pads and game controls. They, I think it's kind of evolved by itself, but eventually it's all also sort of like you know, going to kind of one single interface, which is. Uh, at some point, going to have this. I'm going to talk maybe. Uh... No, it's it's just fascinating because I was thinking, how do you do a new product that introduces that with your body, your clothing? This is the new interface, and then also you need to learn all this choreography that becomes a language of communicating with that with that object that you're wearing that you're also becoming as you wear it. Um, but yeah, this is something that very interests me in your work and this more philosophical level that this is about actively giving. Uh, objects, products, things, you know, agency, and so this reciprocation of communication. So that's, that's fascinating. It's also a little bit, bit scary. So my next question would be, if we already covered a little bit about Jacquard, what, what was uh, Soli about as a project? Yeah, so Soli, um, I mean, all those projects are part of the same kind of family. I, I, as you as you can see very correctly uh, noticed, is that the... Um, uh, one of the critical elements of what we've been trying to, to work on is uh, once you add a technology to everyday things, you're kind of changing the paradigm in a sense, and you're adding this uh, sense of agency to everyday things, right? And um, um, and it's it's both philosophically and technologically very challenging to think like, well, well, if you have everyday things and everyday things becoming smart and different, like what does it even mean, right? How people get get, get, get used them, uh, use them, right? Um, we were very fascinated by this thing, by the way. We we felt that this is, you know, as technologists and kind of you know future futurists, um, we think always we're excited about things being, you know, technological advances and kind of new. But you know, like when you go for things people have been using all their life, like 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 a jacket or or a pair of shoes or I don't know a table, and which was normal passive static object. How can we change people's perspective to give them this new, a regular person who maybe not excited about technology, uh, to get them excited about this new new um, new capabilities which just became possible, right? Because not everybody has 
uh, interested in technology or interested in new, new functions, they mostly focus on very kind of utilitarian view, view of the world. Um, so in Jacquard, we try to create a surface uh, in around the human body and around objects and have it very private, right? So like only you can touch a piece of clothing and only you, it's, it's very close to your body and you can protect it, right? Um, the other approach to functionality is to use space, a physical space, the air, for, for, if you will, as an interactive medium, right? So understand uh, where technology can um, kind of understand uh, your gestures and, and behaviors in a physical, in, in a free space physical world, right? Um, people have been doing this. Actually, my early work, within much earlier in my career, was virtual reality. And in VR, virtual reality and augmented reality, that's kind of like understanding your free space uh, interaction is, is one of the most critical things. So the problem with that, for those of us, you always have to wear something. You have to wear the bracelet, you have to wear, wear some, some object. And we said to go completely the opposite direction from, from Jakarb is to create something you don't have to wear. And by this, does it should not be cameras. So uh, right now, most, most of the interaction in the physical world, the children understand what people do, uh, whether it's, you know, for the uh, gaming or for any other purposes, try to use cameras. And cameras, particularly recently, has, uh, has grown to represent some of the privacy risk for people. Uh, people don't like to have them at all. People don't like to have it there. Uh, using cameras dramatically, dramatically uh, limits what you can what you can do in terms of the uh, representation, where you can put them and how to use them. And then, so we decided to we, we felt felt like and then what was happening at the same time as Jacquard, that if you want to create interactive spaces or interactive volumes, not everything has to be interactive, but kind of interactive volume uh, around some objects or, or, or locations. Um, we shouldn't invent a completely new kind of sensor. We should not go and try to, and this is kind of the opposite from what we had talked before when they do the Jakar, we try to mimic these technologies and we're going to build a whole new kind of sensor. And we decided to build, uh, the project solely became that sensor. We've decided to build a, a radar as a sensor, a new kind of uh, sensing capability which haven't been existing before for consumer world, consumer electronic world. Now, the radar's been around for a long time. And radar is one of the invented fortunes during the war. Uh, and uh, the, the, it was one of, the, one of those um, on the same level as other massive development at that time. Uh, and since then, it stays kind of this niche in, um, in automotive, maybe, in uh, airborne radars for the... For the um, for the airplanes, for the you know traffic control, you know open defense reasons and so on and so forth. The other thing is obviously radar with the time associated with this gigantic antenna pointing in the sky and looking for the satellites. Right, that's kind of if you think people are radar at that time, people that's what people think. Uh, but the radar is not about antennas or signals. Uh, or exactly, not about the antennas or physical hardware. Radars is about encoding the electromagnetic signal in a certain way. So when it bounces back from the object, you can decode it back and understand how far the pro object is. But also, uh, as um, as the radio bounces back, it brings back a lot of information about the object it's being bounced from. It, it, it can bring information about shape, material, uh, local movement, movement, and so on and so forth. So it's a very rich sensing modality. At the same time, it never brings back the pictures. It shows what people do, but it doesn't show who the people are. And you cannot see, you cannot really hard identify a person from that, from that image. So and this became a project solely. So we made the world's smallest, maybe the size of uh, uh, one of the, ta of, of the stamp kind of thing um, device, uh, which was also extremely very, very inexpensive and um, which could measure at the distance of about, it can go up to 10 meters, but we were usually, usually very relatively small distance, uh, around like one to two, two meters, um, from five centimeters to one to two meters to understand, um, to capture people's behaviors when it's appropriate for the, um, for the, for the customer. So that's, that's the became project solely. And, uh, the, the, it's fascinating because on one side you have a, this device which can kind of imaging, it's an imaging device which can understand, which images motion in the space. And on the other side, um, just like with the jacquard, 
it creates a completely new way to, because the signal is so different and we can capture so many things which we cannot capture with, the, with, the, with visuals in a very different way. We cannot simply draw an image and show like, oh, you can see this, you can see that, you can see that, right? So, and you cannot use human intuition to understand what it means, what, what those particular motion means, right? It's, it's the image extremely, it's a multidimensional uh, reflection of radio frequency wave. Um, so I, and that was a challenge because we, we would not, uh, most uh, we would not be able to understand what those people mean. We could not build the intuition. So, and we applied, um, what we moved on is to apply the artificial intelligence to understand the meaning of the thing. Um, and uh, that was kind of a, an interesting step for us because, uh, we will look at that. Like right now, this, this big boom of AI is, is happening, um, but you know, if you look back at this, it didn't happen until relatively recently. It, it, like the real big boom of AI was happened when deep learning, the model deep learning techniques really became really powerful to processing text. It happens about um, maybe six years ago. There was a sudden jump in capabilities. But even before ChatGPT, it's hard to imagine the world before ChatGPT, but even before ChatGPT, there was this non-incremental jump in capabilities uh, of artificial intelligence where suddenly people realize that like it's 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 with enough data, with enough processing, with the deep deep learning techniques in neural network, it's can actually be very, very powerful. And um and the, the be the best example is Google Translate, which was mostly used kind of like a combination of not deep learning and other techniques, suddenly it became really, really good. It happens like literally almost seems to be overnight, right? And uh, so we said before that we realized that, like, look, you know, like if you want to understand the signals which can clearly alien. And she was not capable to see them. Evolutionary, we are not able to understand them. We can't do it by ourselves. We need, we need help. And this help is artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence will help us understand those things. So this project slowly became about three things. It became building a new sensor, understanding how the interaction would happen in the physical world uh, where things moves around and, and the kind of and people's gestures, motion, and tiny different variations of their heartbeat can be captured and be used to control the systems. And the third one is how they build artificial intelligence system, which understand this alien language or alien signals, which nobody else can understand. Um, so this is what became Project Solid. Ah, it's it's very it's very interesting, especially with this uh, understanding interpretative uh, model. What is happening? So what would be an example? So somebody can like. Uh, understand that. What what could be like a tangible, understandable example of that? Well, the very first product we released. I mean, this the. Um, I just want to maybe step back. One of the kind of dreams of kind of like uh, quintessential kind of goals of interaction design, right, is to build computers which don't have the interface, right. So that's the interaction designers want, because what you really like. You really, um, or you have interfaces when interfaces help, right? Um, when you have a pen and you draw on the paper, right? Um, the the act of drawing, so there's two parts of it, right? One part of it is the you want to kind of transfer your intent, what you want. You can only transfer that into the kind of a representation which can be shared with people. That's why we wrap. But we write something to to communicate, to tell somebody else, right? You, um, or to ourselves, like to record for posterity our notes, our thoughts, our like something to pick right? So it's all about communication, externalizing your thought on your intent, right? There's a second part of that, right? The second part of that is that the, the act of writing, the act of doing something, gives you new ideas and gives you new things. Tools are not just one directional tools for taking what you said in my head and externalizing this into the piece of paper on, on a screen. Tool, tool, these tools are also a an engine for creativity, right? They kind of spark the thought. As you draw, as you make something, as you cut, as you as you write, the new thoughts coming up from mechanical motion of, of the hand. So um this is where we it's about the process, right? So and um so it's a, so there there is this 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 this, but this creates this tension, right? Tension design interaction. On one side, you want to be to create a process where your intent and what you want to say is being translated into the output 
as efficiently as possible, right? This is this is a, you don't want to walk around with this whole thing. You just want to get out, right? And you know today's fascination with chat GPT and this technology, which is fundamentally interaction technology, not less than artificial intelligence technology, is is a new way for us to in a few simple words express our intent, and then uh, the AI fills the blanks, right? So it does all this hard work for filling things up in the middle for the AI. But on the other hand, it does not going to work for everything. And we will discover these limitations because this does not allow us to, um, it, we're lacking, it just removes this element where you can, uh, by, by drawing, by writing, by doing actual physical work on the device, it reduces kind of your amount of creativity which you can produce, right? It's, it's losing this creativity is part element. And for different people, it could be different, obviously. I mean, I'm not saying for everybody the same. And for many use cases, it's fine that just get it as possible. So there's always a tension between this interface. On one side, you want the interface completely disappear and just go there and do stuff for you and you don't have to think about it. On the other side, uh, a lot of things we do require this kind of like interactive feedback. Continuously when you're using the tools and tools give you feedback and that changes the way you think about stuff. So with Soli, uh, the first direction uh, we, uh, the new the first direction is very important, right? So we focused on using Soli as the interface which does not exist, you don't see, right? So again, gesture interactions, body understanding, body tracking, and body, uh, body intelligence, use that as the way to express your intent. Because human body and the way we behave and the way we act and, 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 and this, all these nonverbal cues are very powerful communication medium. It means, you know, people say that like 90% of our communication is not verbal. Um, which I think is actually quite correct. Uh, I mean, 90% number uh, is being criticized in different literature as uh, not exact and so on and so forth, but it doesn't hide the fact that it's, you know, when you go into the, say, go, go into the crowded place, crazy go into the bar, right? Just by moving into the bar and looking around, you already understand what's going on just by how people behave in the bar. Who is together, who is by themselves, who is, you know, just, just, reading newspaper and just busy who is, you know, looking for companionships or who is want to, uh, you know, like just by, by, by looking at the, at the, at this, at the, uh, everybody in the room, you immediately have an idea what's happening. Same thing with the office or meetings. You go and walk into the meeting, you immediately know the atmosphere of the meetings, what's going on. Is it tense? Is it friendly? If it's relaxed, if people are working really hard, like all of that, you got to get, get a full body language of the people, right? So. This idea to bring this non-verbal component to the interaction with the computers, so the computers understand what you mean, what you want to do, and you don't have to explain every single thing to them. I think that's something we try to do with Soli. We started with the we we, we, we had the project with Pixel Four. Uh, Pixel Four was this phone by hand. Now, it's actually one of the best Google's phones. There is a really really like it. Uh, you know, it's shiny on both sides, kind of thing. Piece of piece of glass, kind of like. Uh, really nice little obelisk. And um, so the Sony was built in there and it was used to allow people to control the phone again with the very simple gestures without having to touch it. So you don't have to go and touch it to, to perform certain functions. So as you drive or you're in the gym, if you want to do a basic control, dismiss the sound or uh, well, switch the track or uh, you know accept the phone call, all those things can be dealt with the simple gestures. Again, very similar to the jacquard, je uh, left, right, and, and closing. It has. Uh, it was very early stage, by the way. It was very early attempt to build the language. And some of the use cases were very, very natural. For example, when there is a alarm clock goes on, and when your hand is approaching, the volume will drop. And this kind of nice, uh, nice sort of like analog, um, analog qualities of the sensor, which gives us. Um, very kind of like uh, implicit versus explicit interaction, right? The so gesture and touch is explicit interaction. It's interaction you need to think and you do. And when when the phone rings and your hand is approaching it, uh, this is what we call implicit interaction because you're going to approach it anyway because you need to pick up with, or do something like that. So the phone should be able to understand this implicit interaction and react to that. Um, and that was really magical because whenever technology does something you did ask it to do, but it matches what you want to do. That's a real magical feeling. And there was a few 
interactions which we built for the Pixel 4 were really, truly magical for that reason. Because the, the phone would, would kind of predict your intent, understand what you want, and then react to that intent in a way which makes sense. Uh, so those things was, was exactly. And I think that's why technology, that's right, 100%. So technology, I think, interaction and future interfaces, they have, they will be moving more and more toward anticipation our intent. It's anticipatory technology and anticipatory interactions. And then if anything, chat GPT and these large language models is all about that. If you think about it, it's you writing, uh, by writing a couple of words, you know, draw me a giraffe with, uh, with a, you know, with, with a party hat um, to the Dali. What it does is try to anticipate what you really want, right? And it draw you this giraffe, right? Um, it's all coming down to that. It's anticipatory technology and anticipation of people intent and giving them something which makes sense. And that's why it feels so magical because you don't, because we're so programmed to tell exactly what needs to be done, to spell out every single thing to technology, explain every single, you know, cross every T and dot every, uh, every E, that way technology can fill the blanks for incomplete message that would make technology break. Um, so yeah, let's talk about how uh, Solly and Cochet, uh, a French brand, how they came together during the Paris Fashion Week last year. Yeah. Yeah, Cochet, um, you know, because I work with Jacquard and uh, we we kind of let people, uh, we had like, both we, we, we have a, first we grew kind of like cultural understanding of how the fashion companies work and what's like, what it means to a fashion company, which is very different than for working with technology companies, very different types of mentality and the process is different. So uh, that was definitely uh, some one of our kind of superpower of my team at that time. And um, and so we, we the Cochet brand approached us and they were looking for, um, again, this new expressive tools to express uh, their creative creative view, creative ideas in the form of, um, in, in, in the form of fashion. And it's kind of split in two parts, right? So uh, one thing which we started working with Cochet is this kind of like a second generation of Jacquard where uh, technology is not just sensing, but also part of the display. So you have woven, some sort of woven display display functions, which could be a fiber optics or regular display, but like how you bring display to a building. So one of the part of the project was uh, building the smart garments, garments with which would change appearance depending on people's behavior. So you can not now connecting people's behavior with expression of what happens uh, on your garment when you be here. So that was very exciting. And very um, women, they, they, they produce several garments based on those conceptual vision we want to get on. And for the Soli, this this fact that the technology is so, um, first of all, it's obviously private. It doesn't capture, it's not cameras, and they're not recording your, your fashion show and guests at the same time. It's completely private. But the second one is because it's such an indirect way to map what's happening in the physical world into the world of technology. I think that was very fascinating for the uh, Cochet team and their creative um, creative team. So we we use technology to create sort of this digital shadow of the of the model moving through the through the uh, uh, do, do fashion show. So as they move, the radars would, would be installed on the bottom of this of of, of this entire like walkway and um, and then they would they would together cre- they would tr- they would create this image a cloud of of motions moving on the screen which is basically this big screen behind 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 the walkway and other screen gigantic scene from the entire length and then there was sensors installed underneath the um the podium and as the person moved it's okay this cloud of this person moving next to it and every motion of the person, the moving hands, the moving body, would move some of the particles. It's almost this particle cloud directly mapping physical motion into these particles. And those particles were, were changed into the uh, 3D elements or to the um, to the little um, uh, icons or emojis, uh, rockets and smiley faces. And so overall, it's created it's a really incredible... Um, symbolic experience for people watching both clothing, people move around and and the space behind it. So that's a very, 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 very exciting step toward 
the next generation of moving forward, like with with this technology, where you start connecting visuals back to the uh, back to the uh, back to the physical to sensing, being building a fully connected experience where you have an input and output working together in the ways which is, you know, not a touch screen, you know, and not like a, a mouse, you know, but a couple of new ways to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw the videos. That was great. That looked that that looked very uh, very interesting. Uh, and I'm curious if we're going to uh, see other projects like that or if Koshe will uh, continue to experimenting with different technologies. That was also my thought. And what level the brands engage with technology. We saw lately the AI wearable pin also being uh, presented on the catwalk. So so I always wonder how, how technology enters the garment. Is it, is it for, I don't know, creating new experiences and utilities like, like you said with the card? Or is it sometimes about this like performative aspect, or is that about the newness in technology? So that's always quite fascinating to see what it, on the long run, what it uh, what it becomes. Right, right, hundred percent. Yeah, and you cannot. I don't think you can separate them. I think you, don't, you cannot separate them as technology becomes a integral part of human experiences, everyday human experiences, which is which is new, right? Like if you think about computing and mobile phones and wearables and that stuff. This is relatively new, right? Um, uh, as, as things become a big part of, the kind of human experiences, uh, the performative component um, will become as important as functional component, right? And, and that's just how everything happens with every technology, right? So if you look at, you know, at cars, if you look at um, you know recorded media like TV and and radio, all of that will be as a highly functional technology, communicate messages you know, during the war, something like that, earthquakes, uh, became a part of people to express their creative uh, needs and creative desires. So I think every technology moves through that fashion, through the cycle. So uh, with the technology we're building, we, we're pretty much certain that that's kind of new technology is going to be also used in creative, creative way. So let's jump in and talk about uh, archetype uh, AI. I'm curious about the name. Why is it called archetype AI? And yeah, what is the physical, uh, what is the physical AI? Because it's something that you also uh, I saw on your website that this is mentioned, and yeah, sounds intriguing. Thank you. Um, so the archetype AI is you know is company, right? We clearly uh, um. We it's a group of us who would be working all the technologies we we I'm talking about were built by a group of kind of like collaborators and thinkers who think about the same way. So, and um, as I mentioned before, um, when we did Soli, the you know, one of the kind of uh, uh, breakthroughs we developed was building artificial intelligence technology, which allows us to understand these complex signals and behaviors. Right. So, like when you build all the solid interfaces, were very different from classic design for the interactions, which were designed by human designers. Um, but were the designed by the fundamentally was understood by AI uh, because signal was so so complex and um, data was so complex. So uh, this AI breakthrough became was very important and and. When ChatGPT and large language models and foundation models kind of broke out uh, from academic and kind of like labs into the physical world and you know took it all by storm, we thought it also the time for us to try to take all these ideas which had before and uh, start a company and try to put together a new kind of foundation model which is not focused on. Online, because that's what today's world is all about. It's all about online. It's about your pictures online, your photographs of online, your information online, your, you know, typing things and asking, you know, but your digital persona. And um, and go directions where, like, build foundation model which understand physical world. It's about physical world, this thing. Um, and so, and this is makes a very different types of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence which can take a variety of inputs which happen in the physical world from sensors, from from your um, from people's intent, from things happening in the physical world, um, taking uh, also information about the physical world, which now accessible because of the uh, all the slice language models, we have now a an engine which allows us to interpret all the things. 
And by combining them together, we can build the uh, intelligent system, which can understand, which can uh, implement all the ideas I talked about, which is uh, taking a variety of threads of, of people's people's behaviors, of people's interests, of people's um, people's interactions, and understand human intent, what they want to do, and achieve this kind of goal of creating intelligence where there is no interface. So the end of all the interfaces. Um, and that's sort of sort of the the uh, that's that's when we call it physically AI specifically, so not to be the same as large language models. Uh, it's we're building AI for physical world, which focus on physical world. From there's a, there's a technical and and obviously philosophical differences. And the second thing is that uh, this AI, which we're building for physical world, will not only understand what people's people's would like to do. And, and understand the world around us and create uh, and help us to control have control the world a little better and manage the world better because we have so much more understanding of what's happening. But also we have a generative component which would generate interface in real time. Whenever people need to have representations, and most of the cases we believe the AI would be able to understand what people want and do this without us intervening. But there's going to also be many cases where we need to have feedback. We need to have a that sort of reaction or communication, and the the interface will be generative. It has to generate it on the fly. It has to create this interface and give it to you, and then remove it when it's not needed. So, so this is basically so basically creating a system, this kind of physical physical AI, which understands physical world and generate all the interactions. Um, that will be sort of like a a final you know, ultimate ultimate among many things. It's going to be filed, a final ultimate user interface. Which can replace all other interfaces, maybe in the future, and that's what, that's why we call it physical AI. And we're building this model, and because when you go, you know, it's different from being using online world and the physical world. Because in the physical world, one of the most important there's two components which don't exist in the online world. One of them is time. Time is actually important in the physical world. Online world is kind of timeless. You know, you put something online it's forever. Where you put it doesn't really matter. It just kind of this big pile of gold. In the physical world. We're looking at things changing over time. We're looking at history of things, and and we understand what happens in the future by understanding the past. This direction between the future and the past is very clear separately. So we're looking at the patterns of behaviors, the patterns of behaviors of physical world and humans, and that's why we're building this model we we'll call large behavior model versus large language model, because language is static, and behavior is dynamic. So the large behavior model is what we're building. And then, obviously, that's probably the question you hear a lot, but what happens, you know, potentially when the needs are misunderstood, when this anticipation, you know, potentially fails? I know it's about improving, but there is this one thing that there is this um, uh, universalism applied to it. So basically, there are cultural differences, different behaviors, different contexts, uh, even with younger generation appropriating certain, I don't know, even if with behaviors, gestures, and even emojis that, I'm a millennial, so for me, one emoji has different meaning, one gesture has different meaning. But for someone 10 or 15 younger than me, in the in the same setting, in the same situation, standing in the same space, it can be something different. So how, uh, I'm just curious, how, how is this being uh, approached? How do you approach that? First of all, I mean, there's two components to that, right? Component number one is that, um, component number one is, how technically you would implement that? How technically you make the AI learning, like quote unquote learning or trained on these new new ideas? And you know, these techniques are quite quite established with this with large language models. Uh, there's a techniques to um, what we call fine tune them to the new meaning, right? So uh, the models are being constantly fine tuned for specific audience or for specific use cases. So all this kind of like uh, cultural differences and separations, we believe uh, technology is there to f to be able to fine-tune the models for specific use cases. This is one piece of it. The second piece of it is interactive piece, right? Is Okay, so even if you can fine-tune the model for specific things, how would you be able to do that so that uh, it's not disruptive for the for the interaction, or how would you understand that these piece people need, need fine-tuning and these people don't have, need, that does need fine-tuning? At this stage, um, we don't have an answer for that yet, like how we actually build exactly experiences. Um, 
Uh, but it, it's, it's definitely something we'll be working on. I think generative AI component, generative, generative uh, UX component, right, will give people the opportunity to react to what what if the if the intent is wrong, right? So this uh, this is there's always should be in in whatever system you build, there's always have to be a feedback loop from the human. There's always have to be able to opportunity for the humans to come back and correct or go back step backward and restart the game, right? So this this uh, or uh, this feedback loop which allows people to correct mistakes is very important. Uh -huh. Okay, that so that so that makes sense. I also I also said that I will come back to what you said about body as real estate as a as a land, and I'm also thinking about surveillance and privacy. So um, is it is the body still my body? Is it a sovereign body, or is it the body that only coexists in relationship with technology? And let's say not now, but in I don't know ten, twenty, thirty, whatever years, uh, however far we go in future. Um, how, how can, how do you, how do you imagine it? Do we, do our bodies physically coexist in this embedded interaction? How do you see it? It's, um, I mean, how far, you, how far in the future you want to go, right? I mean, it's hard to say. Um, the, um, who has that 20 years? You know, don't think it changed in 20 years. 20 years ago, there was no iPhone, right? So let's just, let's just remember that. And, and no, no mobile phones was like pretty clunky. And there is a, um, as, 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 a, as a technologist and a futurist, I think, um, I feel technology would help us to um, live longer, better, and, and, and more fulfilling life if we do, if we use it the right way. And then the, Opportunity to use technology to improve our body is already there, right? You know, you have um, implants, you have different different devices which helps you, and beat pacemakers. Those are all those examples where you're giving away some of the control of your body to machines, but not just to machines, but also to other, 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 other people, right? So the doctor decides what implants to put there, right? And in this respect, our body is written. No, it's already not our body necessarily completely, right? So we. Uh, our body believes uh, we 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 already kind of like giving control of our body to the doctors, right? Who decides what needs to be done, what doesn't does need to be done to the to the society in general, right? Which decides, you know, your behaviors in the in the public spaces, right? It's not they are prescriptive and prescribed by the uh, cultural norms, but also by laws and regulations. So the question becomes: Is no, so in this respect, we already not completely. Um, Private and completely self-included individuals, right? So we are really, we're really sharing everything, uh, pretty much uh, about ourselves, just with this particular, but but with particular government, government bodies and, and corporations and so on and so forth. I think the question comes not necessarily about and technology. People look at this technology as some sort of often fa kind of fascinated by technology capabilities, and imagine what if this technology do A, B, C, and D. Um, but I think this is not a question of technology does, but what we as a society decide technology should do, right? Because technology is a blunt object. It's do whatever it, humans ask it to do, right? So if the government, um, uh, as in a cultural society, uh, it's it's for us to decide what, what, what the technology is going to be to. And it comes down to the question of trust. Of do we trust those um uh, cultural bodies or cultural or organizations which have access to information about our body and our behaviors and access to our to us uh, do we trust them to to cover this access right how can we build this trust how can we maintain this trust and this is not a question of technology it's a question much more question to to civics to society more than the question of technology or, or to the um, to the people who build the technology um, because without technology, again, without this technology, I'm, and I am seeing technology very broadly, like electricity, for example. Uh, society will not survive. There's no questions. We can, we, we, we would not live for long, right? Um, uh, without, without, um, you know, vaccines and, and, and medicine, we, we're not going to survive. Uh, we're going to be wiped out by the next, whatever disease is going to come, and it's going to be over. Um, so you need technology. We, 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 we only survive it because of technology, right? Uh, the 
uh, the, the, the question is like how we as a society, um, uh, sort of regulate and, and, and use technology to the bad without stopping the progress, because once you stop the progress, that's not good. Um, and of course we, it's, and I think at the end of the day, my personal opinion, you want to build the trust. We don't want to go back to archaic society, you know, like back to, back to living in the caves, uh, assuming that's the goal. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, it's less about technology, it's less about regulations of government, it's more about uh, building trust. Uh, trust between all the people involved, because, you know, us as a you know, populace and the government bodies and the corporations and people who do technology, how to build this trust is, I think, the biggest the biggest challenge right now. And then I don't think it's a technology question, something else. Yeah, how to uh, how to have a hope and trust in humanity is a definitely a big question, but I think that would be for another another conversation than today. Um, another another recording today. Well, I think we can uh, we can end here on the hopeful note that we can hope for the for the better. Definitely, what you said made me think a lot about mainly about philosophy, about uh, such concepts as necropolitics by Hilda Membe. So anyone who listened to it can read about it more because I think it's very relevant uh, for yeah, actor network theory, somehow very philosophical references. You made them come to my mind now. Uh, and I'm not a philosopher by no means. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. It was, it was a great conversation. It was a pleasure. If you like this podcast and you would like to see it to continue, as well as receive more information from Unfolding Strategies, please visit unfoldingstrategies.substack.com and subscribe, where you will get access to our recent insights, reading lists, and podcast episodes, as well as archive of past newsletters, talks, and episodes. Thank you for listening.